All right, today's word, the remnants arising, or where are you? Remnant or residue arising, or where are you? Where are you? Am I walking fully at the place where I've heard clear direction from God? I'm walking in a place of anointing. I'm walking in a place where I'm fulfilling the purpose for why I was born, where he's called me to serve with the gift of service, gifts of healings, perhaps fivefold ministry. I know that I'm called to be in the ministry, but yet I'm not ministering. I know I've been called to be sent out, but I haven't been sent out. I've been called to go out and start churches, and I'm good at starting other things, but I have not stepped out to do that. So where am I on that timeline of what God has called me to do with my life, the very reason that I was born, the very reason that God put a destiny in me before the foundation of the world that I'm supposed to walk in to accomplish to be here. None of us are here just to eat good southern food. Praise God for southern food. None of us are here just to breathe oxygen and to take up resources here in the world, merely to do that. Those are blessings to us. But we are here for the destiny, the purposes of God, the, the big, big picture. He's got some place in that plan for my life, for me to walk in and to be a part of it. This is going to vary from times to time, from season to season, from ages to ages, from different people groups to other people groups. What your grandmothers and your granddaddies walked in in their generation and what was good enough then spiritually, I'm going to tell you something, it's not good enough now. You're not going to make it. And I'm going to show you right now historically some of the things. This is prophetic, this work message is today. And most of us are familiar with parts of this, perhaps bits and pieces of it. But when I began to get back into this and, and realize the significance for such a time as this, it, was, uh, it really brought a soberness to me when I saw how current this really is. In review, just, taking, just setting the scene for this or the, the stage for it. In Galatians 1.15, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. In verse 16 in Galatians 1, it says, he separated me. He began to, to put grace on me and, and began to do a work in me. And he did it for this reason. He said, to reveal his son in me. I'm going to read it again. To reveal his son in me. That is God's plan. That is his purpose. That is his destiny for each one of us. It's not for us to be a fringe pew warmer, bench warmer, and get the pom-pom out and say, go, daddy, go. Go, friend, get out there and prophesy. Go, uh, whoever else is doing it, whatever we're doing. Go, Pastor Lane, do what you do. It's not what, what this is about. And then we get into a concept called ages. In Ephesians 2, 7, he says he wants to show the riches in the ages to come. Not age, ages. There are multiple times, shiftings, there are changes. The age that the patriarchs walked in was totally different from when the law came on the scene to when Jesus came on the scene to when Jesus rose from the dead to, to the uh, Pentecostal movement when it, Azusa Street hit. It's different now than it was then. And the Spirit of God is moving and requiring a difference and his men and women to rise up to meet the challenge of the generations as we go through this. And that's what this is about, this word today. And Pastor Hen had a, a dream back in 1989. I'm going to reference that about a boat. That boat was a, the access to go from where the body of Christ is back out into the world, literally. And we're going to look at the history of that in just a moment. Because the remnant wasn't really much of a part of the church. It was there, small group. Back in the 1800s, 1900s, as we moved into this century, it's becoming more relevant because the, the very nature of this age is such that the remnant church has to rise up for any hope to be there for the future. This is a pattern historically that takes place, and as I've shared in the past, there are times where God gives the destiny and purpose for a nation and the people walk into it, begin to walk it out, and then they get in sin and move toward darkness, 
And God has to move with judgment on the land. When he does that, he always rises up that remnant who walks through this with victory. He prepares them ahead of time so that they can make it through it. And they get on the other side and they reestablish the purposes of God. This season is what we're in. Don't listen to Fox News and all this other stuff that we're all going to be nuked and we're, it's all, we, we have no hope because that's not what this is. We are walking with the hope, the answer to the, the problems in the world system. Well, if we don't do it, God, guys, it's not going to happen. God's going to raise somebody else up is what he's going to do. But he's got to have some people to co-labor with to do what he's called uh, for us to do. All right, so let's look first before we get into the, the, the dream here at the word remnant. Now, it's interesting when I, I begin to do a word study on this word remnant, uh, the word she'ar, yether, sherith, uh, sha'ar, it's a different shar, it's a different word, it's the main root word here. Uh, those all had the same meaning, especially in ancient Hebrew, but they all have different numbers in the, in the Strongs. That's unusual. I have not seen that anywhere else, but there are actually seven different uh, Hebrew words for the word remnant when you begin to get in there that are primarily used for that. First one means to be the residue. It means rest. Now, that word rest has two meanings. That means the rest that's out there versus everything else. But what else does it mean? It means to shut it down and those that are uh, in, in the, the relationship with God where they're resting in his presence, they walk in that walk, they're uh, praying continuously without ceasing daily, always in communication with God. They do not ever leave that place of abiding in him and him abiding in them. There's a peace that's there that denies all understanding, even going through the midst of the storm. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? Okay, there's a lot of us here in this church that are mature that have been doing this long enough. Well, you know what I'm talking about. We had to grow to it, right? It didn't happen when we were first born again. What is left is another meaning here, but in the ancient Hebrew, it means, remnant means this, to tie, to get a cord. And, and there's a picture in the Hebrew of stress on the, on the mouth, on the teeth, and, on, and then there's a picture of the head or the beginning of something. When you take that and begin to apply it, it deals specifically with a triple braided cord. You start with one cord and then you just begin to wind around that, the other two strands. And the remnant of those that get so intertwined with the presence of the living God, so intertwined with his purposes, so intertwined that they will, are, are ready to walk out and to sow daily wherever he has us to sow, they're so intertwined that they're never going to take honor and glory from him or anybody else. They're going to serve him doing what God has called them to do. If, regardless of what it means to leave behind. The remnant is not a group that embraces the big house, two cats in the yard. It used to be two cars, three-car garage. You got to have a place to put your boat and your motor ski, your, your jet skis and all that other stuff, all your toys, because we're prospering. Name it, claim it. God, you got to be right with God if you get a lot of money, right? No. God's not, he uses money as exchange just like we do as far as giving that to us for us to, to use to build the kingdom. But prosperity, we know that's a different definition. And we have some people here that know that understand that, I believe. It means to have an arm or a wall around a person. An arm or a wall around a person. So if I'm a member of the remnant, I'm abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. Go back to Psalm 91. I'm at a place of safety. And it doesn't matter what I'm walking through. God is going to be there with me, and he's going to protect me. Now, I may go through some persecution. In fact, I, I may be going to be with the Lord. That's okay. I'm still in that peace, and that's where I'm going to remain. So these are some practical applications that are embedded within this word remnant. It means this. It deals with the imagination, twisting together of the thoughts. In other words, imagination is equal to renewing our minds. See, my thoughts begin to get intertwined with God's thoughts when I do get in that word and begin to read it every day. When I do get into the place where I listen to the messages and take notes and go back and chew them over, go back and review what's on the YouTube or Facebook uh, broadcast of, the pro of, of our services and get it into my spirit, man, 
and it becomes who I am. And I begin to not just use that as a reference to go back and think on, but the more I get God's Word in my mind, those become my thoughts. I have possessed them. I take ownership of them because I abide in Him, you see. That's what abiding in Him means. Now I'm able to walk this out as a remnant because I think like him. So after my imagination is twisted together with him, it deals with my emotions and happiness from walking intertwined with him, hand in hand, on the path he has for me. So it's renewing my mind. It's walking out the path of my destiny. Number three, it means to separate myself from the world system. I have my mind renewed. I'm walking the way he's telling me to walk. I make the determination that I'm going to not pursue the toys, but I'm going to pursue the one who's worth that I'm living for and dying for. Amen? All right, so number four here of what this is embedded within the meaning of this word remnant in the ancient Hebrew is a wall of defense. It's a resistance to the enemies, to the enemies of, uh, of light, which, which would be darkness. So this is a, a spiritual wall is around me, and I am a spiritual wall. I am a door. I am a gate where God himself dwells in me when I walk out and begin to speak and pray and decree. I become a gate of heaven on earth. That's who we are. That's the power that we walk in when we're walking as, as a member of the remnant. So I, I have my imagination by renewing my mind. My emotions and happiness, joy actually comes from this as well, from walking out that path he's got for my life. I separate myself from the world as I'm intertwined with him. And there's a spiritual wall as his arms around me to protect me, but also resisting the forces of darkness. And the fifth thing here is I become a worshiper. I become a worshiper. When we as a man get out of ourself, and get to the place where we're willing to be recklessly in abandonment in worshiping God. And we understand the seven main ways of worship. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about me. I'm going to bless my God. I'm going to worship him. I'm going to give him the honor where honor is due because I'm intertwined with him, see? I mean, there's, I cannot, I, there's no separation between me and him. We are one. There's a merger that's taking place in my life where now I can go in and truly accomplish what God's called me to accomplish in my life. Does this make any sense? Okay? So the second, or I'm sorry, actually it's not the second word, but it's, it's, it is, it, there are four words that had the same meaning that I just gave. Okay? So this would be the fifth word. So read is this word. It means a survivor. Uh, the root of this particular word is the idea of slipping out of or to escape to survive. The judgment that is determined for this age is not for us. It's the, uh, for the ungodly. God's determined that we're going to escape this. Most of us will. We're going to get on the other side, and we're going to slip out of this, and we're going to be at a place where we're going to be able to rebuild when we get there. The next meaning uh, of this word remnant is pelata, again, which means escape or deliverance. Jehovah Mephalti, the God who comes to deliver me. That's the, the, the reality of that. And then the, ne the, the last word, uh, akareth, a remnant, means to be on fire. It means to be posterity. It means to have the hope for the future. Have the hope for the future. So that's what we should be as a remnant. I should be on fire for God. When I walk in a room, things should shift. Should, they should, the atmosphere should change just from the very presence of God on my life. That's what remnant means. If I'm the rem part of the remnant church, these are things that will be characteristic of my life. So the question is, where are you? Are these defining who you are in your life, in your walk right now? Or is there something else going on here? Well, let's look at the, some of the things dealing with the dream that I just mentioned a little while ago. Uh, and and um, let's see. I could get in all these principles. I'm going to just move on because I want to get it right into the meat of this. In 1989, Pastor Han had this dream. Now, at that time, we were in our fourth year as a church. Revival fire was burning strong. It was powerful. We were seeing signs, wonders, miracles. We'd gone from a handful of people to over 100 people in a year, just like that. Within six months, we had to go to another building. And then six months after that, we had to go into another building. 
1992, we had to get out of that building and we came over here because we just didn't have room. It was busting out. Everything we, we were doing, God was blessing. So Pastor Hen has this dream in such a time of outgrowth and outpouring, which didn't fit what was going on, but it was a warning for what was coming up for the future. In this case, there was a boat in the dream that, that represented the world system. And he saw seven groups of people that were on a river camp on the side of, the, of a, a river. And they were the remnant that was there. They were the church of God, let me reword that, that uh, were there together in that camp. And he saw that some people began to run toward that boat. Some made it to the boat. Others missed it. They got there too late when it left. Others ran to the boat and they missed it and fell into the water, which we know that water is symbolic of the sea of humanity or it could be of death with the Jordan River, which uh, would be spiritual death in the, in the, the picture here. And interpreting dreams, you, a lot of it's symbolism anyway. The pilot determined everyone's fate who got on the boat. Not everybody in every group got on the boat. Some people just didn't even try to get there. But four of the seven groups that I'm about to share with you, they, got, they tried to get on the boat, and they made it, pretty much. Well, I think one of them didn't make it at all. These are carnal believers. These are people who have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God. In 2 uh, Corinthians, I'll tell you what, let's put uh, Numbers 32, 23 up there on the screen, if you will. This is the problem when you get into this. We try to mix in the world system with ourselves and try to be a Christian too. And I grew up in that kind of a, a, a denomination where you could have your sin in Jesus too. And it just doesn't work. And as a result, I sat there for years, and I'm going to tell you which group I was in, without growing, without having any fruit in my life. But I was there and I had walked the aisle. I knew I was saved and born again. But I hadn't repented any more than the man in the moon had and was struggling with, with my walk all the way around. In the 1800s, Pastor Ann began to realize that three groups came out of the church during that season. We had had the outpourings and uh, the Great Awakening. We had the Second Great Awakening, a, a century plus or minus a few years difference later. There was a, a group that began to form in the church where people were walking in their salvation, and there was a little bit of the remnant that was there. But by and large, most of the people were not on, on what we'd say on fire for God. And it, what God historically does, he raises up, it's certain seasons during the, uh, the course of history where ungodliness comes in and there's a decline in the kingdom. He has revivals that come in periodically. And then every now and then there's an awakening that comes in that totally shifts the whole culture. But over time, there's a, uh, an increase of the kingdom that takes place through that process. So in, back in the 1800s, there was a sweeping in of a lot of people into the kingdom of God with the, the, especially that second great awakening. But the, the first group that came out of this that God showed Pastor Hand in that dream was the Beatitudes group, Beatitudes. This particular group was, is called the, those that are poor in spirit. Those that are poor in spirit. That particular group, they pursued to rush to get on that boat and have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God. These are still happening today and have happened up to this point. But the problem with this is anytime persecution comes in and begins to hammer a group of people in a nation, these groups dissipate. They go back out in the world or they run to one group and one group only and that will be the remnant. They get on fire for God and they make their way through it. So you're not static. If you're in one of these groups right now, that doesn't mean that you got to stay there. You can move from one group to another maybe more than once in your life. These groups, are, are they make a, a rush for the boat and they strive for the things of the world, but that doesn't mean you've got to stay there. And these, these uh, groups will separate you from your families too at times. But here, here back to the Beatitudes, they expect the unexpected in faith, but they don't receive. 
They have to believe stuff in faith but out of necessity because they walk in poverty. They have an El Greco spirit on them. Every dime that they get, they spend it, and they spend plus that. They go into, into debt because they're, they're totally givers, and they're not moved to the place of being a taker. I'm sorry. They're totally, totally takers, and they're not givers. They can't shake the strongholds of the flesh, so they're walking in bondage still. There's little fruit of the, of the kingdom, but they will experience God's will in their lives, and they will be saved if they truly have been born again. Now, these people in this group will not be leaders. They will not be worship leaders. They will not be prayer warriors. They will be a member of the church, but they will not be bearing much fruit. So that's the first group. Again, there's some of these, they're still in existence even now. But this started back in the 1800s, and 19th century. 1900s. The second group are the godly achievers. And I remember seeing this group. They were the older group that, that uh, uh, my, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, I saw this on them, the reality of this. These were people who were in the church for many years, but they never changed. They got on the boat and hope for worldly stuff and worldly finances. And they were blessed. In fact, I have some relatives of mine that were in this group that had been called in the ministry years ago, and they, they uh, refused to move that way, but God still blessed them and replaced them in, the, in what he wanted done. But he blessed them financially to bless the, the, the generations to come and to help build the church up, which is what, what this particular group has, has historically known, been known to do. They got on the boat and hoped for worldly stuff, they were blessed and were financially successful. They did accomplish God's will and do accomplish God's will in their life to a degree. Again, these are not leaders, worshipers, or prayer warriors. Their main role in the church has been to help build and supply provision for the church. They too will experience the salvation of the Lord. And, you know, I look back on this and I can see so with great clarity how the church over the, the course of the last couple of uh, decades and, and uh, centuries that it's been that way. The third group were the unfruitful. That's where I was. Pew warmers, the fringe. And this group increased significantly in numbers from the affluence after World War II when prosperity came in. This group lives a double life. They have a besetting sin that's present. Often they walk with a religious spirit, trying to walk it out through works to cover up that they're not right with God. They cast out seed, but very little comes in for harvest. The womb aborts. They don't have any, any fruit that comes. Their only hope is to confess their sin, to repent, and move to another group. So there is a hope for that group. But they've got to repent and change and move. So in summation here, this is, these have been around a long time. Uh, we roll into the 80s, and we begin to see a differentiation uh, uh, within the different aspects of the body of Christ that starts to be, to, to be set in place. You know, the Lord sets in the church everybody that's supposed to be there. There's diversity in the gifts. We all have a different purpose and a different place. That changes over time. It could be a different purpose in a different place as we go in our walk with the Lord. So for us to remain static in our thinking, we need to be flexible to understand that we have to flow with where Holy Spirit wants us to be. So the church from eight, the 1800s through the 1900s, three main groups, the Beatitudes, essentially they were saved only. The godly achievers, they were saved and they were givers. And then the unfruitful, they were carnals, uh, carnal, religious, spirit-type people who bore no fruit of the kingdom that only were there right at the gate, but they were not going to be able to cross over. So... We move on into the 1980s. Judgment comes on the church. We see uh, Jim Baker. We see Jimmy Swaggart. We see a lot of shifting that takes place. The Jesus freaks and Jesus culture people had come in in the 60s. There was a shift that's taking place in the culture from being uh, at least favorable to the things of God to becoming anti-God and ungodly in orientation. And Roe versus Wade kicks in in the 70s. And now we've got worship of Baal that's nationwide, and we see the children being slaughtered um, without mercy. And, our, and the good people didn't do anything about it. So at the same time, though, in God's mercy and his loving kindness, he begins to move on the heart of men, and Pat Robertson rises up and starts Christian TV in 1966. 
you have uh, ACE curriculum kicks in 1970. ABECA kicks in 1972. You've got Focus on the Family that comes in. Christian radio stations start popping up. And so now there is an opposition to that sets in to get to raise up a generation to the charismatic renewal in the 70s and 80s to be harvesters, to bring in the harvesters for the great harvest that we're in right now. That's what that was about, I believe. So that's just a, in a nutshell the history that took place during that season. So out of the church now comes a different dynamic. There are different uh, uh, other groups that start to, to pop out to make these seven groups. Four more come forth. The first one is the godly weary. The godly weary. The godly weary. They don't understand at all what it means to be in Christ. They understand stepping out and doing something and say, God, I pray for you to bless this. Instead of waiting and God telling you where to step, and then you bless into it, you don't have to pray for God to bless it because he's going to be right there and he's going to bless it. That's the way it works. The godly weary had no training in that. Pastor Han himself confessed that was what he was in originally when he was sent to the mission field, when he took off, when he was trying to minister the gospel, and he was a Baptist at that time. That he had to strive, he struggled with it. He did not understand that faith was not a struggle. Faith is action, standing in the promises of God of what he's spoken to you, and walking and collaborating with him, and you see it come forth as you speak it and believe God for it to manifest. So this, this group struggles. They strive to find a place with God. They tend to get offended and leave the church. They do not understand that faith is not a struggle, as I just mentioned. But the, and those that know that they're called, they struggle to be a pastor, to be a prophet. They may have a dynamic personality to draw men and they'll get up and there'll be a, a, a flash pan type thing where they'll become a star and all of a sudden it's over with because they burn out. How many of us have seen that happen? You know, it's happened a lot over the course of the years. Don't go uh, looking for rock star pastors, prophets, all that. If you can't get it in the local church, you should be able to get everything, especially in a five-fold ministry church like this. You should be able to get everything in the local church and there'll be supplement that, that God will bring in from other places to help. But uh, right, by and large, it's going to be in that local church. They strive to attain ministry but never make it. They don't understand what the, the Hebrew word barak. It's just not there. They make a rush for the boat before all said and done fall in the waters. And when persecution comes in, that particular group suffers the worst. They suffer more than the other ones do. I don't want to be in that group. Pastor Hen came out of that group, by the way, when he got here. All right, group number five, the gifted of peace. Your gift will make a place for you. This particular group, they do not pursue the boat. All the, these other four groups, the godly weary, the beatitudes, the godly achievers, the unfruitful, they take off to get in that boat. The godly weary don't make it. They end up falling in the water. But that's, there's, that, those four groups head that way. So the gift of the peace, these, most of the time or often they're women with unsaved husbands. They walk in the peace of God, which eventually wins their spouse. They often, often like to live in the shadows of the background in the church. But they're solid, they're the real deal, they're there, they love God, and they help support the ministry through prayer and some other things. Many never prophesy or teach, and often they receive the supernatural without even asking it because God blesses them in, their, in the state that they're in. Often they are worship leaders. They're workers in the church, but they resist being in the limelight, and they live a life of satisfaction and blessings. And again, they may be an intercessor or, or be used in some other ways in the church. They do not pursue the, the boat. They, they remain in, uh, in the house. The sixth group are the armor bearers. This is the group I, I moved into after I came out uh, being in the, um, the godly weary, no, it was the, what was it? The unfruitful. God moved me from being the unfruitful group when I got right with him, got baptized in the Holy Ghost, and then he moved me right in as an armor bearer. These are prayer warriors and fighters. The demon possessed seek you out. Violence pursues them, but they walk in great faith and the violence is deflected and they begin to see it on the other people around them. 
They are intercessors who have great fruit, but the fruit they produce, they end up giving to other people to eat. They understand Barak. They are seed planters, not waterers. They are soldiers who willingly put their life on the line. They're not concerned with earthly goods. Uh, they do not pursue the boat at all. And then you have the final group here, the residue. And these are all in that dream that the Pastor Ham was seeing, and God begins to give him the revelation of what each one of these groups means. And I want the, there's a purpose for this. I know this is old. We've been here before. But there's a purpose for this because God has given me insight prophetically before I ever set in, stepped in this office of some subgroups that are within the remnant in this season, which we're about to get into here, that we need to understand where we can fully walk into what God's called us to do for such a time as this. The residue or remnant, they know the role is not in the hope of the world, but in the kingdom of God. This is the seventh group, the remnant or residue. They contend with the world and with the kingdom, the evil kingdom that's here. They don't strive, but rather co-labor with God. They understand his will, and they flow along with him and his voice. They are leaders of the new wind. They are leaders of the new wind. There's always a remnant that God raises up whenever he needs to clean up the mess. And these are the leaders that walk in with that new wind. They walk in faith. They walk in the spirit. They, have, they are patient enough to wait and don't try to promote themselves to start their own ministry. They wait for God to open the door and promote them. They understand that he's going to do that in his timing. They allow God to promote them. The people think they're clergy even when they're not. So you can be a member of the remnant without even be a five-fold ministry. People think you're, and I know some of y'all have told me that you're, you're that are not five-fold ministry here, that people ask them all the time, are you a pastor? And they say, you're not. Well done, grasshopper. Okay? So you're, you're walking as a member of the remnant and people picking that up on you, those of you that have seen this. They understand there is the reality of the power of God. Holy Spirit indwells them. He's for us. He's in us. That power will manifest and be a testimony of Jesus Christ. Even if we, we speak it out, Holy Ghost will also speak and testify. They cover all leadership functions within the church, especially in the five-fold ministry church like this. They hear the word. They, they understand the voice, and they hearken and obey it. They understand lordship. Not just the Savior, but the Lord of, of uh, uh, Lords is their Lord. They never rush to get to the boat. Now, when persecution in any culture kicks in, all of the other six groups that stand and continue living for God, they merge into the remnant. The only way you're going to survive in a season where the government, evil men begin to come against God's people, is going to be to be a warrior, to walk consistently in his presence, to hear his voice of, if I, I, Lord, I'm going to town right now. I've got to go up to the church. You better go through Opelika, son. Don't go down the road straight to the house because there's going to be some terrorists there. There's going to be a, 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 a stop in the road where, where there are going to be some people that are going to cause some problems for you. There's going to be some major issues with the military there. Don't go that route. Go this route. Or don't go. Stay here right now. Don't go until I tell you to go. I've learned to, to, to flow with those hindrances that I used to get so frustrated with. You know, I'm, I'm a, I like to focus and go do. I still got that much of the business in me from years ago. But there are times where God just has that, you're going down the interstate, and this guy comes over and drives 50 miles an hour in the fast lane. And he stays there. And this other guy comes up right by him and stays there at 50 miles an hour. Does anybody else have a test of their salvation like I do on that? I, ha I can truly testify I am saved. I hadn't lost it over that. What's wild is when that one finally pulls over and you, you think, praise God, and he's going up. And three more come out and ride and do the same thing. I just, Harriet knows what I deal with on that. Bless her heart. <laughs> I am saved still? Okay. Amen. All other groups merge into the remnant of residue when persecution comes, a return to the world. Now, we're transitioning into this today. So what does it mean, this prophetic word that God has given me now 
to take what the apostle that founded the church and laid in prophetically of what was happening. And, and we can see these groups have developed over these years. There, there, there's no doubt about those. Now, the Lord showed me the, the additional step. Now, the season that we're in, there are five subgroups that are beginning to develop within the remnant itself. The remnant is going to be special ops. We are. That's what we are. We have to be. We are the answer to the problems in the world. We have the hope we carry to the world that nobody else in the world has, and that's Jesus Christ. Not just salvation, but total shifting of the culture itself has been the pattern over the course of generations. We are an antibiotic for the sickness of darkness in the culture and in the church. We are to be offensive and anointing in nature and take back what the enemy has stolen. That's our purpose and our destiny for such a time. So the first subgroup as a part of the remnant of those who prepare and train, those who prepare and train, be made up of, of apostles, to be made up of prophets, to be made up of teachers, those that uh, can minister and prepare people for what's coming and their, their uh, very specific purposes. This group are visionaries, visionaries who bring divine restraints and direction. Divine restraints. Now, what that means is, for example, evangelism, going door to door, was good in certain places in certain times in, in, the, uh, in the past. That's not going to work for this season. But there will be other methods where we use using social media. We will use mark, in the marketplace along the, uh, wherever we're working and walking and purchasing uh, what, just in life. There'll be times of outreach that we'll go out and use it, the old techniques where we'll just sow seed at random among, in uh, crowds of people. God would show us what to do on that. But it would be a different th type thing. And those, those divine restraints are the boundaries of what Holy Spirit is saying. This is where you operate. This is where you go. This is how you do this. It's not going to be necessarily like it's always been. It would be something different. These are worshipers. They are also the administrative government of the church. They prepare, they teach, they train. Okay, so these are visionaries with the divine restraints. These are worshipers. They're administrative in government. And they prepare, they teach, they train. Now, what is required for you to be functional in this group? You have to have an extraordinary prayer life. You've got to be at the place where you can pray and you can I'm going to tell you what you end up doing most of the time at this level is you end up throwing a few things out there that you say, but most of the time you're just sitting there listening and waiting for God to speak to you. Now, if you have an apostolic gifting, which several of you guys have, y'all listen carefully, that uh, I've, I've had the blessing to be around some outstanding apostles. And I know of several that, that uh, have caught a handle on this at such a level that just astounds me. One in particular is a, a contractor, very successful in the area where he lives, but he, uh, he builds these high rises. Most, I mean, he's, he's been blessed and prospers and a great giver. But he, uh, he goes into one of the units that he has that's, that uh, has not been sold or rented out, and he will go in there, and he's got everything set up with his business. He's got everything set up in the church where for five hours to eight hours, at least one day a week, all he does he shut the door, he shuts his cell phone down, he gets away with just him and God, and he started out to begin with, and he would just pray. And then he mixed in some worship in this. But an unusual thing began to happen over a period of time when he did that. God began to shut him down with speaking, and he began to worship that whole time. God inhabits the praises of his people. When the, the apostolic anointing is such that it has to, to, to be based as a foundation of the revelation coming from God. There, therefore, the prophets, remember I've told you that when I walk in and I make a bridge, by writing that book I wrote, I made a bridge for you to do it. When that revelation knowledge comes in me, then I share it, then you can prophesy in that, then you can teach on that revelation and begin to sow that into people, the rhema of it. I'm looking for the teachers to rise up in this season to take the revelation knowledge that I have been sharing over the course of these years.
Because y'all got to step up. Otherwise, this is going to be lost. Now, it may be picked up on, by the next apostle that comes in. But we should have somebody, at least several people, that are, begin to shine as a teacher in this church now that take with the things that we've sown into y'all over these years and begin to ex, ex, uh, expound on them and share the rhema to equip everybody. And we're already seeing some of that. We're already seeing some of that. So this first group that prepares, equippers, and trainers, those who prepare and train, exceptional prayer life, they understand covenant relationship because out of relationship comes ministry. Okay? The second group, subgroup within the remnant are those who see, those who see, those who hear. Uh, we all, you know, we call them seers, but that, there's, that's another term. I don't want to mix this in with this. These are revelationists. This is just what I was talking about. They see and they hear spiritually. In First Chronicles twelve thirty two, the sons of Issachar were a very small group. There was two hundred of them that were used to bounce off of and get uh, direction from for David's army. They they were people that were set apart. They sought God. They recognized the signs of the times, and they would give direction on that. Then in Amos chapter 3, it says that God does nothing without telling his prophets beforehand. So that, these are people that are going to see what God is doing even before it comes in. Uh, they admonish, they encourage, they warn, they give direction, they intercede, they teach, and they counsel. They admonish, admonish encourage, they warn, they give direction, they intercede, they teach, and they counsel. This group, much time is requ required waiting upon the Lord. This group understands what it means to be in Christ. They have to. These would be your prophets. These would be your intercessors. These would be your teachers. Those that operate in the gift of discerning of spirits, and they can be your worship team people. Okay? So there should be the seers and the hearers. And you have a place right in there with the preparers to help to uh, minister to the fifth group that we'll get to in just a moment. So the third subgroup in the, in the remnant are the healers. The healers. Those are carriers of the virtue of God. We all have some of that in us. This particular group will move in deliverance. They will move in, in the realm of, of healing in the heart as well as in, the, in the, uh, the body itself. Luke 10, 1 through 2 and verse 9. I have tons of scriptures I've just not made reference to because I want to get to the, these points today. But uh, the, this is, is part of what we talked about in the past. But again, this, you've got to be in Christ to do this. After these things, the Lord appointed over 70 also and sent them two by two before his face into every city place where he himself would come. Now, in the scripture, these 70 are not apostles. These are not anybody of any great uh, wealth necessarily or popularity. These are just average people that are following him just like me and you. So he tells them, I want you to go out. And he says, therefore, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Pray. I want you praying before you do this. What they do, they end up going out in Christ because as they pray, God begins to download to them a love for those people and the loving kindness of God, the goodness of God for being around Jesus and being his disciples. So they pray that night, the Lord of the harvest, that they would, he would send them forth into the harvest. And the next day they go and they heal the sick that are therein. And every city they go to, and they say, the kingdom of God has come unto you. And this is a, a, what we're, we're to do when we, everywhere we walk. Now, yesterday, I guess it was yesterday, wasn't it? When we were at Cracker Barrel, was that yesterday? Friday? Okay, yeah, it was Friday. Uh, we just happened to be, by chance, we happened to be over at Cracker Barrel eating lunch. And as we're there, there's, uh, I didn't see as it happened, but I'm sitting here facing this direction, but I guess that's about this angle, this vector, just right outside of my peripheral vision. I heard it, but the, uh, 
There was a lady that was there who slipped when she was trying to get up out of her chair. And she hit the floor pretty hard. We just happened to be there. Okay, well, bird dog, Lane over here, when the, when the Spirit of God gets on her, she's like a, y'all know how bird dogs get when they, they go out uh, hunting quail. Y'all know what the, dog, the dogs will do when they start pointing? When Holy Ghost speaks to her and she sits, starts getting focused, everybody better get out of the way because here she goes. Yeah, she's scary. And I got up right behind her. I was, right, I, I was heading that way too. When we got over there, we were able to minister to, to her, pray for her for healing. And the manager was standing right by me. And I didn't catch it, but somebody that was with us heard. He said, that's the power of God. Okay. So they were seeing that there is power that's there. And what we, the only thing we did, we, we just did the ABCs. We, we made ourselves available. Okay, we're there, God, just whatever you want us to do. We were bold. We didn't care what anybody was saying. And I know everybody in that, that side of the building heard what we were doing. Uh, and, and actually, most of the time, there's going to be an overflow on the fringe, and somebody out there is going to get their attention, and it's going to make a difference in their life. And then compassion. You know, I told them, well, you know, one of the ladies in the group came up and thanked us. I said, look, we love you. We don't want to see anybody suffering like this. But she must have you know, hit her knee and her leg, and we prayed over her. I hadn't heard anything on that. But healers are going to walk around, and they're going to run into that because God's going to take them to the places they're supposed to be, and they're going to be able to heal people. They're going to bring them in the house because this is not going to be just physical healing, but it's going to be uh, the other areas that need to be healed, the heart, the soul, the salvation, the deliverance. They're going to be worshipers too. What's required for this is holiness, Barak, much time with the Father. You have to have faith. You settle the word. By Jesus' stripes, people are healed, period. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. I'm not going to let my experience, I'm not going to let anything that somebody says, I'm not going to let the haughtiness of the ungodly come against me to keep me from believing what I know God's Word says. You settle it in your heart, then you can move in this. This is not optional. You've got to trust on that Word and have your identification in Jesus. All right, so your, your, your first four groups, or first three groups so far, subgroups, are the preparers and the trainers. Then you have those who see and hear. Now we're going to do this to a degree. All of us will, each one of these. But we're going to get to a place where we're going to be so strong in these areas, we're going to see signs, wonders, miracles happening at a regular basis. The third group was those who heal, carriers of God's virtue. And then the fourth group are the harvesters, the gatherers. Everyone is supposed to be doing this anyway, uh, doing the work of evangelists. But these are those that especially labor in the harvest. You walk in a room, the t- atmosphere is, chi- uh, is shifted. You make the comfortable uncomfortable. You go in, you start t- talking about the name of Jesus. You start talking about sin and where people are. It changes people's perspective, and everything in the room changes on conversation, maybe even stirring, stirring up the demonic. It's prophetic evangelism. It's intercession. This gets into the place of hearing prophetically. All right, you're going to run into somebody that's going to have red hair today, and they're going to, that's who you need to go up and minister to. It could be words of knowledge on, on healings, whatever. We, we know we've had some training on this already, right? But that should be our normal mode. God, what are you speaking today to me? This is in the morning. Prophetically, do you have a prophetic word? Is that part of the seed I'm supposed to sow into somebody today? God, is, who is it? Is there somebody I'm supposed to minister healing to out there today? And if so, how will they be dressed? What's, a, what's something that will be a sign that I'll be looking for? What do I do with this? Show me exactly what to do. It's not a going door to door. It's not random. God's going to show you specifically where to go that the person is going to be a providential appointment for you to go to and minister to them. Prophetic evangelism and intercession. The power of God will move. The spiritual gifts will be there. And worship and praise are are, uh, dynamics as a part of that they require. So you've got to have uh, the ability to hear the voice of God and be faithful. The ABCs, make yourself available, bold, and compassionate. Understand in Christ and the the love of God. Those are required there. So there's the fifth group here that's left. 
Those who need to go to the hospital. Those who are busted up. Multiple marriages. Drug addiction. You know, we could go on and on and on. Coming out of human trafficking, whatever it is. Having the answers for them. Ministering to them. Those that are sick and in need. The four of the groups will be ministering to this group. We'll be pouring into them as we go in to heal the heart. Salvation. Teach them to renew their minds. Teach them it's one thing to be born again, but then you begin to work your salvation out with fear and trembling and going through that process of sanctification, which includes renewing your mind, to truly get to that place of salvation itself. Heal with sickness in the body. Deliver the demonized. And do, introduce them to the great physician himself, Dr. Jesus. So here the question is, where are you? Where am I? Where are you supposed to function? What has God spoken to you, given to you, your dreams about, visions about? What is God's purpose for your life? Where are you supposed to fulfill his will? When, if not now, when are you supposed to do it? These are all things that came to my mind as I was going through this and preparing this for, for such a time as this for our church. First Corinthians chapter 12. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Verse 18. But now God set the members, every one of them in the body as it has pleased him. And I know this deals with the spiritual gifts, but it also deals with us as, as individual beings as well. Same principles carry with this. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet one body, and I cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. The reality is, I need each one of you. I need each one of you to step up, to be that man, that woman of God. Begin to function in the gifts that God's called you to function in. I'm going to endeavor to do the best I can to do the same thing. And then we're going to see this world change. We're going to see the things happen we've had in our hearts for years with the outpouring of God's Spirit. Because we're going to be ready to, to, to walk into it. He's waiting on us, I believe, more than anything else for his body to get ready. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular, and God has set some in the church, first the apostles, then the prophets, the teachers, those that work miracles, the gifts of healings, helps, Governments, diversities of tongues. Now, this principle is all here. Then he says to covet earnestly the best gifts. So we see the principle of God's word there. The prophetic is here between the dream and the vision God gave me and the, the word. And that's the, I believe, where we are right now. So who here feels that they're called to be a preparer, one that can train? It's, it's supposed to be helping to raise up those in the hospital. Who sees and hears? And what level are you supposed to function right now in the church? Now, this is what not just happening in our church. This is happening all, all over in the body of Christ. Now, I will say this. I know in our fellowship right now that within the churches, those that uh, have a pastor who's doing the best they can, I know the pastors in these churches, but they're struggling mildly right now in this season. I mean, they really are. But the, the churches that are fivefold ministry that have all five of the fivefold functional, they seem to be doing well and actually they're prospering like us. So, and, and part of that is the reason the remnant mentality is coming in and we're beginning to function in these subgroups the seers, the healers, the preparers. What group do I fit into? Did this ring a bell in me that, hey, you know, God's been speaking to me about this? This may be something I need to be moving more into. And we're going to go into more training in this area as we go. We'll see what God does with it. Hopefully this made some sense to somebody. Okay?
Lauren, you ready to come on back up?